Okay, Malama, that's the magic word, the Malama solar success story. Okay, we're going to hear from one of the founders, Rachel Asu. Hi, Rachel. Thank you for joining our show today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So this is um, uh, Energy 808, The Cutting Edge, and uh, uh, Marco is on travel. Marco Mangelsdorf is on travel. So we want to talk to you about your company. Um, you know, there's a lot of installers in the state. Uh, some of them make a lot of money, I must say. Some of them don't. And then they're always faced with the competition of the do's and the don'ts. And they're faced with the competition of the guys who come, the big guys who come from the mainland. And so uh, a couple of years ago, you decided to take a jump into this frothing pond of, act, of com competitive commercial <laughs> activity in a high tech industry. And I want to know why. <laughs> 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 well, that's a great question. Um, it, it's been quite the journey. Um, there's a lot of reasons of why my husband and I decided to start the company. And a lot of it was just, I actually wasn't in the path of solar. I initially just wanted to be a professor. So I loved learning. I love teaching. And that was kind of the path that I wanted to take. My husband's really great at sales. So he was in sales and um, would travel a lot over the summers. He started selling solar after we got married. And I really loved that because solar, I've always been really passionate about sustainable energy. You know, I was born and raised here on the island. And um, the island being the big island. The island of Oahu. Oh, oh, um, Oahu then. Okay, yeah. good, good, good. Yes, we're on Oahu. We, um, so, and I've just, you know, it's really ingrained into our culture that our resources are very limited. And so when we started down the path of solar, um, it was just pretty interesting because there are a lot of solar companies out here, but there aren't as many who were as concerned about the experience. And um, I think that there were a lot of solar companies that were kind of, um, at least in our experience of who he's worked with, uh, didn't care so much about the customer um, as much as the sale. And so that was something that we wanted to change. Mm. How have you changed that? Yeah, so uh, it came from a, a couple of bad experiences with previous companies that he was with. Um, and there were just different things that the customer wasn't informed about in the process. Um, there were times where things weren't going the way they should have and the customer didn't get the attention they needed. And so what we've done is we've developed a very tedious process where we're always constantly checking in with the customer. And that's ultimately what we built the company on Malama because Malama means to care for. Um, and so that's caring for the customer, the community, our employees, you know, everything around. And I think that's what's been so magnetic about it is, um, is that everybody can see that and it draws, it draws people in. You know, we just had a show about that a couple hours ago about how, how the commercial world has changed to gathering data on people rather than treating them as individuals and customers. They, you know, mm -hmm. they became, they become, they have become in large part, you know, um, uh, digital. Uh, rather than people. And uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to hear you say that. I think it's very important for any business now, especially a business that wants to make an impression on new customers. Yeah. <clears throat> so, okay, so, but it's a technical, it's a technical business. It's a business where you really have to know the latest and greatest technology and method of installation and connection. You have to know the rules, the regs, um, getting, you know, permits and um, permissions from the utility company. Oh, gee whiz, it's enough to give you a headache. So <laughs> who's, who's in charge of that, Rachel? Is it you? So I handle all of the operations. Um, my husband handles a lot of the sales and a lot of partnerships. Um, fortunately, here in Hawaii, if you know you make a good name for yourself, everybody knows each other. And so it's just a very strong network. Um, so yeah, we, we've we all kind of worked together closely. Um, we have a lot of great leadership with our company and, and we all collaborate regularly on a weekly basis to 
look at certain inefficiencies and try to brainstorm and plan ahead. Do you, uh, do you ever talk to your competitors and ask them questions? Because, you know, it is it is the land of Aloha and um, it happens in various uh, industries and sectors where you can pick up the phone and get some advice from a guy who would like to compete with you. Do you have that experience? Uh, we have not spoken directly to our competitors, um, but we do have a lot of um, people who come over from, uh, from our competitors' companies over to our business um, just because they, they see the benefit in, in working with us. So we have a lot of sales reps who have come over just be, because of the experience that they've had um, at other places and the experience that their customers have had. Oh, interesting. So they jump yeah. ship to join you. I like the sound of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, we've been really, really fortunate. What do you offer them that, that attracts them? Um, ultimately, it's, it's the whole package. I, we like to say that we have um, some of the best sales forces on the island. Um, the process is constantly, our operations are constantly being worked on and improved. Um, I mean, on a daily basis, we're constantly meeting about it. Our installers, they know, you know, it's always quality over quantity. Um, and Chris and I, we are very much so involved in every step of the process. So we're not the type of owners who's just going to kind of sit back and everybody knows what they should do and, and just kind of leave it at that. We're very much so in the trenches and involved in the process. And I think that that overall gives everybody who works within the company a better experience. Oh, yeah. So you have sales reps uh, and then you mm -hmm. have installers, too. Um, mm -hmm. So how, how big is the company in terms of sales reps and installers? So we have two installation crews um, and then we have uh, our sales team is about 20 to 30 people. Oh, wow. A big question, Rachel, big question is, you know, you started before, not too long before, but before COVID ever happened. And then one day in January 2020, we were in a new world and uh, we didn't realize that at first uh, maybe we were fed misinformation to think that it wasn't going to affect our lives. But we found out soon enough that it was going to affect everything, including mom and pop businesses like you guys. And so how has it affected you over the past two years in which you've been operating in COVID? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's, that's a question that we get asked a lot because um, a lot of businesses struggled at the, at the hit of when COVID first hit. Um, and we were not exempt from that. We did, definitely did struggle initially. And um, Chris and I, you know, at the beginning of COVID, we had one employee. It was just myself, Chris, and one, one other employee. Um, and we knew that it was either sink or swim. So we had to learn how to adapt and um, to fit in with the time. So we started working on virtual sales so that we could still have business coming through. Um, tried to you know, really dig in about what we can do to make the installations safe for both the customer and the installers. And, um, it definitely took a few months of kind of getting our traction and figuring out how to work through it. Um, but yeah, we were, we were able to fortunately pull through that. And, um, and because we were able to do that, we've, we've seen phenomenal growth within the past couple of years, I think. Is that right? Of that. Well, that is so interesting. Can you, exp I mean, I, I know you said that you found better ways to do things. Um, that mm -hmm. you found better ways to engage with uh, clientele and prospects. Um, but what can you give me more about that? What is it um, that makes people want to do solar in the middle of a pandemic? What is it? Um, I think that a lot of people were just, most people when they know that solar is a good thing, right? So they know that they want solar. Um, they know that in the Hawaii market, it's especially great. Um, but I think that it was more so they didn't have the time to sit down and it's, it's an investment initially. And so a lot of people, you know, were concerned about that. They had a lot of unanswered questions. And I think that when they were able to take the time to be able to sit down and learn more and find out that it's 
not a big investment initially that it can essentially just swap out their utility bill with their solar bill um, that that they got the bigger full picture of what was going on. Mm. So is there, you think, a relationship between the attention in the press and in the world on climate change and um, you know, the interest of people here in Hawaii uh, to install solar? Sorry, could you could you repeat that? Well, we have a lot of press lately about climate change, and we had, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, in our in um, Scotland, <laughs> Scotland, we we in Glasgow, we had this big COP twenty six meeting, and it was in the newspapers uh, for mm, oh I don't know weeks, and everybody talking about uh, you know climate change and what what we need to do about it and i just wonder if you if you saw an increase in interest here in hawaii um, because of all the press that climate change has gotten yes absolutely i mean we've i feel like hawaii's always been a very special market i feel like people all over the world are very concerned about the environment but especially so here in hawaii because we have such a fragile um ecosystem and we heavily we're in the middle of the pacific ocean right so um if we really need to protect our natural resources because otherwise we're relying on all of them to be shipped to us and and shipping isn't always the most reliable option um and i think that there have been definitely some steps moving towards solving that problem um do i think that We've been all in in ensuring that we're going more the sustainable path. Um, I think that we could do more. So no, I don't think we've fully committed to that. But I definitely think it's really important. And I think there's a lot more that can be done to mm. take steps in that direction. I totally agree with you. Do um, you have any thoughts about what that extra step would be is it is it legislative is it regulatory what is it you know just in our experience in the solar industry um we've seen a lot of um bottlenecks in certain areas a part of it is um with getting the proper approvals that we need so whether it be from utility or from hoas you know hoas a lot of times meet in person and with meeting in person what's an hoa what is that a uh, hoa is a homeowners association so okay got it got it okay mm -hmm. so we need their approval so there's been some bottlenecks there um primarily in our state the huge bottleneck has been with permitting um and so i think that you know there's a lot of things that the state and the city can do to kind of standardize um the processes so that we can get these things installed a lot faster because it's not a matter of the companies not wanting to do it, right? It's not a matter of the customers because everybody wants to get solar. It's more so a matter of the different hoops that need to be jumped through in order to get it installed on your roof. And so I think that if everybody could get together and just collaborate, all get on the same page of what's expected, how to get certain things installed, how to accomplish the goals that we want to accomplish, it would help to significantly increase and expedite the process of, of moving to a more sustainable lifestyle. Yeah, I hear an echo of what you were saying in the first place, um, that you, you, know, you meet with your staff, you mm -hmm. invent new, new systems, you improve old ones, you make everything more efficient uh, all the time, every day. Um, and so I think what you're saying is you, and I would say the same thing, by the way, Rachel, uh, that you want government to do the same thing. You want government mm -hmm. systems to be more efficient, more expeditious every day, not just uh, we doing it this way because we always did it. We always did it this way. And if it's slow, too bad mm -hmm. for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and clearer communication, I think, goes along with that. Um, a lot of times, you know, we're, we are very um, particular about, okay, what is expected? This is what we submit. And then they'll change certain requirements or certain policies and the communication is not clear on that. And so then we get that package rejected and we have to resubmit the revisions for the new requirements and that holds up the process by several months. And so 
I think clear communication all around um, them hearing out some of the challenges from other companies that have, you know, that they work with or um, that apply for certain approvals and then just all kind of collaborating together to figure out how they can still get what they need, the information that they need, but we can help to expedite and get more people um, set up with clean energy. So when you're talking either virtually or in person with a, a prospect, a prospective client, um, what do you what do you what do you tell them to sell them on this? I mean, for example, if you were talking to me the day of the rainstorm uh, a week ago, I would say, oh yeah, I really need to get solar because all this blackout all over town, predictably, predictably mm -hmm. blackout all over town. So I would say in you know, solar, I can save the trouble. I can not have that risk, um, but there's other things too. So what, what do you pitch to a brand new customer or prospective customer in terms of why he or she should get solar on, on a rooftop, on a, you know, on a single family uh, residence? Yeah, um, well, majority of our installations, I would say probably about 98% of them, if not 100% of them are battery installations. And so one thing that's really attractive is that we are installing batteries with every single system. Um, so if the power goes out, they still have that power, right? Um, and in addition to that, the power that they are receiving today is going to be at a locked in rate. And so essentially, instead of getting their power from the utility, they're getting their power from the sun. And then once, you know, as they continue to pay off their loan, instead of paying the utility, they're paying their solar loan. And um, that's a locked in rate. So they're always going to be paying the same amount for the term of their um, for the term of their loan, whereas if they were to be with the utility and getting their power from the utility, those rates are constantly increasing, especially as um, unsustainable, um, you know, fuel and those prices rise. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so you could really be hit, not always, but sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, the other thing is. Uh, when you talk to them, you know you have to wrap around the the notion of um, of um, how long it's going to take to do this. You know, if I come to you, I really want to know, and I, I don't know. I, I don't have any you know period of time in my mind. I'll, I'll go with the flow on it, but I really want to know in general how long it's going to take for the permitting, uh, utility permissions, and connections, and all that, uh, and the construction and installation or the connection. Uh, how long is it gonna take? What do you, what do you tell them about that? Because it is, as you said before, it's not entirely predictable. Right. Um, it's not entirely predictable, but there are definitely some timelines that can be roughly predicted. Um, HECO came out with a great program called Quick Connect, um, which essentially gives them almost instantaneous approval from the utility to get installed. So that's been great. Um, as far as the approvals are concerned, the HECO approval has significantly increased their timelines, but unfortunately, if they're in a homeowners association, those are still the same. Um, so if they don't have a homeowners association, they can get from the time they sign the contract to installation within less than a month um, with our process. And um, that's considering that we can get their permit online. Um, if their permit is in a different zone, and that's where it really starts to bottleneck is, is with the permitting, if we have to specially walk in the permit, um, those permits initially pre-COVID, they would take about one to two months. But more recently, it's been take, it's behind, they've been backlogged by 13 weeks. And so it's been taking a significantly longer time more recently. Mm, that's three months plus. Ooh. Right. Do they yeah. tell you why? Is it they don't have staff or what? What 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 slowed them down? I think that it was probably a combination of several things. One thing is they are short staffed, I think. Um, in addition to that, though, and I think probably um, this is the bigger driving factor. Um, I don't 
want to shoot myself in the foot here, but I think that there could be um, a smoother system. I, I know that with a lot of the permits that take a long time, um, you walk in and, and you put the permit package that you've prepared and worked so hard on just in a pile um, and then kind of hope they get to it. But there's no real um, tracking system of where the permit is, no assurance that the permit has been received and that it hasn't been lost. And so it's kind of an inefficient system that I think is a little dated. And so I think that there's a lot that can be done to help to um, digitalize the submission so that there's a timestamp on everything. Um, and then you'll be able to easily track to ensure that it's been received and track the progress of the permit. I think that it would just help to make things easier for the contractors and it could also you know easily help them in tracking a lot of the things that they're reviewing you know honestly that's not rocket science if i if i <laughs> order if i order a keyboard from amazon first i get an email saying confirming that i ordered it then i get an email saying mm -hmm. when they think it's going to ship and then i get an email saying it has shipped and then i get a tracking number and i can track it every step along the way and then, of course, I get I, I get delivery, usually exactly the day they predicted uh, and mm -hmm. promised me. And then I get an email telling me that it was delivered. So altogether, half a dozen emails <clears throat> and emails are so easy to send. It's all automated now. So I think yeah. you and I should get together and go down there and consult with them and show them. <laughs> Sounds <how> good. <laughs> So Rachel, you talked I about. I would love to. <laughs> right, you talked about um, you know financing arrangements and loans and the like. What what do you offer? What is popular among um, prospects and clients these days in terms of financing a system that will cost uh, I don't know thirty forty thousand. I'm not sure what an average system costs these days, but um, you know what 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 do you offer them in terms of uh, deferring the the cost on a loan or installment contract basis or whatever? Yeah, so there's actually a bunch of different payment options that are out there. Um, there are some, we work with a bank who um, doesn't require any payments to be made for the first 18 months. Um, and that's a loan. We have both lease and loan options. Um, some of them have really great um, APRs. So we, there's a 0% APR option. There's a bunch of different options that we have available, and it's really just based on what the customer thinks is best. You know, whether what's most important to them that they just pay it off quickly in a short amount of time, um, what's best in their what's in their best interest for their tax credits. Because if they don't have a lot of tax liability, then it's better for them to possibly lease than it is to get a loan because they won't see those tax credits. So there's a bunch of different things. Um, that play into what types of financing they select. And we have a variety of options um, to help them to decide what would be best for their particular situation. Okay, are people challenged these days in terms of you know, paying for it? A lot of people um, find themselves uh, strapped. Um, mm -hmm. they, they, you know, they can't buy the things they wanna buy or for one reason or another, but COVID is always sort of in, in the mix. Um, do, you, do you find that? Is that a challenge for you when somebody goes south on payments? Uh, we don't see that as an option. I, I, I mean, not sorry, not as an option, but as an issue. Um, and the reason why is because it's not the same as buying a car or um, other things that you want. Um, you're going to buy energy regardless. And so um, if you're paying your utility bill, it's basically just swapping those payments over to your solar bill. And so uh, we don't see so much of an issue of customers saying that they won't be able to afford it because once they understand that it's not in addition to their utility bill, it's just kind of substituting it out and swapping it out and paying a different source for your energy. Um, and once they understand that, then it's not so much of an issue. You know, one thing is, um, you know, we are in climate change and the weather is um, going to get worse. It's not a question of, uh, this is a pun, it's not a question of whether W-E-A-T-H-E-R, uh, but, mm -hmm. but when? <laughs> yeah. That's pretty funny. Uh, 
So the, the, the question is, what do you say to them when they ask you, is this going to hold? If we get a windstorm or a bad rainstorm, no, whatever, it's extreme weather of some kind, is this going to hold or am I going to lose the whole enchilada uh, when the weather <laughs> sweeps over my house? Well, we do warrant the actual installation of the equipment. Now, if the roof ends up blowing away, then you're going to lose the panels that are attached to the roof, unfortunately. That's not something that we can really control. But um, prior to installing any system, we do a very comprehensive site survey, and um, we ensure that the home is first suitable for solar installation and that it's going to last the life of the system. So we inspect the roof and the structure and all of the electrical. Um, and as long as all of those boxes check off, then everything should be good to go. And, and if they don't, then a lot of times, depending on what the issue is, we'll help to work with them. If it's electrical issues, we'll help to work with them to get those things resolved so that they can still go ahead and um, get solar installed. So what would you say your biggest challenge has been over the past uh, couple of years you've operated this, this business? What's, what's the part that wakes you up at three in the morning? I know uh, things wake, wake me up at three in the morning. I figure they must wake you up at three in the morning too. Oh yes, or, or it keeps me up till three in the morning. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I think it's kind of twofold. One of them is um, just with process, with permitting. I would, I'm a very um, process driven type person. So I would, love to just have a standardized process and clear communication with permits. Um, we've already kind of talked about that and, and some things that uh, could be improved there. Um, the other thing is just hiring. It's really hard to find um, really great qualified people that we want to join our team. We're constantly hiring. We have about one new hire every single week. Um, and so we're constantly hiring, constantly training. And um, I think that with just the growth we've seen, we always wanna make sure that we never have bottlenecks. And so we're constantly working on, okay, what part of the process needs more manpower and then hiring and training and perfecting. And fortunately with a bunch of different eyes on things, they're able to identify small little in inefficiencies that help to make things um, better overall, so. Yeah, good. Okay. Well, that's, that's the right approach. I, you know, I, I didn't forget that you said uh, that you were thinking of teaching at the beginning. So um, I'm thinking, uh, I, I want to know what you were going to teach. I, I want to know what kind of graduate degrees you have that would qualify you to teach. And I would like to know how that all connects with running this business. Yeah. Um... I love, I'm a very strong advocate for higher education, and I got my graduate degree in communicology. It's the study of interpersonal communication, and um, I think that I have used a lot of those skills that I learned in the business, but more so than the actual content, I've actually used a lot of the um, work ethic skills that I've learned when I was working on getting my graduate degree and have been able to apply those, that work ethic and organizational skills that I needed for that to the business. Um, so I think that that's helped to contribute a lot. We're super excited. Um, we are going to be hopefully giving back to the community really uh, in the next upcoming year. And that'll provide me another opportunity to be able to help to educate and teach um, members in the community uh, in the community about a bunch of different sustainability options out there. Oh, you mean when COVID is over? <laughs> is <that what? laughs> yeah, when now COVID is over, fingers it's, crossed. it's due, it's due in um, February of 2022. So in March 1st. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, but yeah, we, we've been wanting to do a big sustainability event for the community just to talk about different options of farming and just, you know, all sorts of sustain, sustainability um, lifestyles, not just uh, solar. So we're, we're excited that now that things are starting to open up in the state, we'll hopefully be able to do that next year. Yeah, knock wood. I, I hope we can connect <laughs> at that time so we can do a show about your event. You know, that would be yeah. great to do that. 
So there's one other thing I wanna, I wanna go into before we uh, run out of time, Rachel, and it's this. As you guys, you and your husband, kudos to you for jumping in, you know, starting a business, making the investment, investing the time and the risk, you know, and learning all the things you have to learn to start a small business, you know, kudos to you. Um, it's, it's admirable, honestly, and that's what we need in this state. Um, but I want to know, you know, what you recommend to people who might consider the same kind of thing. Because, you know, you are an exception to the rule. Um, a lot of people, you know, your age, disposition, background training would not do this. Um, but you decided to do it, take the risk. And um, I guess I, I like to know, I like to hear you talk to them and tell them it's okay. Tell them this is what we need to do to make Hawaii work for future generations. I'd like you to tell them, tell them now. Yeah, um, I think that, you know, it's always tempting. And I think that one of the biggest things that might impact some companies is that they're so focused on just the growth. And I think that one thing that we've really tried to do is grow at a reasonable rate for us that we can sustain. So we didn't want to just bring in a bunch of customers that we wouldn't be able to allow to have the same experience that they, a customer who just had one customer would have. Um, so we've always tried to grow at a reasonable rate where every single um, account is going to have the same attention and detail as um, it would if we were just a really, really small company with just a few handful of customers. And so I think that I would share that same message is, you know, it's always going to be tempting to just run, you know, head first straight in, but you really want to work on setting up the foundation first so that you have the support in order to accommodate the type of growth that you want to achieve. Tell them why they should do this, you know? They could always get a job at McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure they can, by the way. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. A lot, a lot of people are, um, you know, in a, in a state, if you will, uh, in a tizzy about uh, quitting their jobs or getting a new job or, or for that matter, starting a business. I mean, the people are in transition and COVID has done that for us, including in Hawaii. So what's your advice on that? About transitioning into new positions? Transitioning into new businesses. Oh, new pe people starting new businesses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, I would think, okay, plan it out first and, um, and then multiply that work times 10 because <laughs> you, we definitely didn't um, anticipate having all of the work that, uh, that came along with the business, but, um, but we were happy to do it and very eager to, to continue on. Um, but there's definitely gonna be times where you're just gonna wanna you know, say, okay, no, I need sleep tonight, you know? And, um, <laughs> So I would just, you know, I think it's great. I think that people starting new businesses is a great thing, especially um, in this economy, we need that. But I think that educating yourself before taking that step is always going to be beneficial um, because the last thing you want to do is, you know, start something and then uh, invest a lot of money into it and then realize that you, you would rather not be the entrepreneur and you rather just, you know, work your way up and work for a company and not deal with the headaches once you got home from work. Okay, let's talk uh, finally about Malama itself and what's the plan, you know? Um, maybe you have an exit strategy. Um, maybe you want to sell or merge or do so, or move or expand. Who knows what? All islands, all neighborhoods, maybe. Um, what Do you have a plan or at least you have a vague plan about where you want to go? Um, and how you're going to become a multimillionaire soon? <laughs> yes, we definitely have a very um, specific plan, actually. So, um, our goal for this year was to be um, one of the top 10 PV solar providers in the state um, and to expand out to Big Island. So, we expanded out to Big Island in August. Um, our goal for next year is to expand out to Maui 
um, for 2022. And then for 2023, we plan to expand out to the mainland. So fortunately for us in the solar industry, Hawaii is one of the leaders in the market or in the industry for um, solar PV. And a lot of, um, a lot of customers here are doing solar installations with batteries and um, the mainland, it, they will slowly start to, the, the other states will start to catch on and start to do solar installations with batteries. But a lot of times um, in most states, they're still doing the net metering program. Um, so I think it's just a matter of time. Usually things start here in Hawaii and then start to trickle to the other states. So I think that um, that really gives us a competitive advantage to be able to, um, in a couple of years, expand out to the states and, um, and then we'll just be, you know, the solar PV battery installer leader, um, the expert in that state. Would you ever consider a merger or acquisition, um, either upstream or downstream? What I mean is either to be acquired, to merge into a larger company or um, to acquire and merge in, you know, with a smaller company. Would you ever consider that? Um, possibly to acquire, um, but we're not really looking into any of the other options to be acquired um, just because we want to, uh, and I mean, I can't speak for what it would be 10 years down the road, but our main concern is um, maintaining the integrity of our process and our responsibility and duty to the other people, um, to all of our customers and everyone here that we serve on this island. So. I think that in order to really maintain that integrity, um, we, we do need to um, be in control and be able to control the process. So, um, yeah. Right on, right on, 100%, right on. You know, you remind me of Josh Powell. He's the CEO of Revolution. Um, oh. And a lot of the things that he says are like the things that you say. Um, for that matter, Rachel, you remind me of Marco Mangelstorff. Uh, so <laughs> these are people to uh, observe and, um, and maybe learn from. Thank you so much for coming up to our show, coming on our show, Rachel. Uh, thank you very much. And I wish you all the best, not only for the holiday season, but in business next year. Your plans should all work out, Rachel. I'm telling you, this will happen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha.